Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Celebrating Canadians. Today we're on location in a local seniors home where we are visiting with a 96 year old former veteran, woman who served the country, who grew up in southern Saskatchewan. Please welcome May Sherwin. everybody we're here with our wonderful Canadian today we're celebrating the life of May Sherwin she grew up in the Wood Mountain area of southern Saskatchewan and and had a good life on the farm you had beautiful siblings and as you grew older the war started breaking out you heard about the war how did you hear about the war well radio of course radio now that must have been quite something when radio began well, that, <clears throat> I don't hardly remember, but my dad bought a little radio. It was about the size of a <clears throat> Japanese orange box, a little bit longer. Yes. And had little tubes about three inches high on each corner, one on each corner. Okay. That was the tubes that, that uh -huh. brought the radio into us. And we had two sets of earphones. Okay. It fit over your head. Well, those two earphones were always, one lady had it on their head and somebody else was listening at uh, their ear. Uh, and uh, then about two years later, he got a horn for it, so everybody could hear. Okay, so you remember though that evolution of communication. Yeah. And so it must have been quite something when you started hearing about the Second World War and what was happening. How did you feel about that? I just felt that I had to go. You had to go. And how old were you? 19. You were 19. Okay. So a lot of things had happened in between. That my brother had, uh, and I had gone in and joined joined the army together, or applied for the army together. Okay. And Gerald was given time off to help finish the harvest because they were so hard to get the harvest off with so many of the people gone to the war. Okay. They meant boys around home. And he was killed by a drunk driver. While he was helping to get that harvest, harvest off, off yeah. and before we, he we a wedding dance. Oh. We went to the wedding dance and da da Dick and his girlfriend were in the cab of the truck, the rest of the truck was full of people standing up. Oh, in the back of the truck? Yes. Oh, okay. No, none of this seat belt stuff. <laughs> uh, but the, the truck was made, so it has a come up, come up like that, had, uh, had a lower rack uh, where they could sit on, on the lower rack. Okay. Because we had a small cheese factory in our area that uh, cheese, uh, one of the storekeepers was raised in Quebec where they had the cheese factories. Okay. And he got a cheese factory going. For the dirty 30s, we lived, we had a cheese factory that saved our lives, I'm sure. Okay, so your brother was in this truck that was also used for moving cheese around and yeah, that kind of stuff? cheese, milk. The milk to go to the cheese factory? Yes. Okay, and, and they were in an accident. They came, took us to the wedding dance and they took off to go to a picture show because they had Mrs. Christensen, a very good friend of ours, who, mom was gone sometimes why Mrs. Christensen was our mom. Okay. And uh, the, we, they had no relatives in the area. Mom and dad, no, and, well, dad and his, his cousin, brothers and sister brothers, but they were gone. I mean, they had their own lives. And, and Aunt Rose didn't think my dad was fit to be around her children, so. Oh, that's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other story. <laughs> But uh, we didn't get to know our cousins, that, those cousins all over a bunch. No. Oh, mm -hmm. mile and a half is the most. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm interested in um, what happened then. Now you've you thought you were going to go off to war with your brother, but he wasn't able to go because now he's passed away. And, and so, yeah. how did this work for you? How did it work for me? Well, I had applied for the army before, and they were just organizing. Okay. They hadn't organized yet, but they didn't know one thing. They were, women were not going to be going into war until they were 21 years of age, and that was it. 
Oh. You could have no children, no girls under 18, no boys under 16. And uh, if you had uh, anybody in your family that was handicapped, you couldn't go. You had to stay with that handicap, no matter who you got to look after them or your children. Okay. It was out, you're not. And you had to be between the ages of 21 and 45. So you applied to be there when you were too young. Yeah, so I had to wait for two years. So what I want to do is I want you to help our viewers to understand what did it look like as you were a young woman in the armed forces? What did that look like for you? I'm just doing a job that had to be done. Okay, and what did you do? Well, that all depends. The time I, when I first went there, they sent me down to Maple. Well, we went first. We didn't have any place to send us, so when they got there, they were just sitting in the waiting room where the they were registering. So when uh, they they had already got a center draft to Dunder and the men's camp. Okay. For training, because there's no place else to send us. Okay. <laughs> And uh, so I had two, uh, a, so I had a lieutenant lady, lieutenant, and a lady corporal. Okay. In uniform. We saw what the uniforms looked like. We were in our clothes, whatever we brought from home, or whatever we brought in the, it, uh, with our first paycheck. And because you didn't have a uniform yet. They hadn't yeah. any real plan for women in the military yet. Oh, they did, but they, but they, had, they had the idea that they would all go down to this place in Quebec. Okay. But that three, in three months, they had no place to send girls and uh, no money to turn us. Okay. So they were having to, they were took that whole camp over for, for officers and senior NCOs, okay. NCOs, n Oh. Non-commissioned officers. Okay. Any from lance corporal to sergeant, staff sergeant, sergeant major. Okay. So you left Regina. I went to Regina. And then to Dundurn. Mm -hmm. And how long were you at Dundurn? I was there a month. Okay. And that was basic training. That was basic training. We were supposed to have at least two months, but we had one month and we were off to Maple Creek. To Maple Creek. And what did you do then at Maple Creek? Lack, practically nothing. <laughs> <laughs> they, we got to Maple Creek. They had a, late, a new barracks. Okay. We were in new barracks in the men's camp with an isolation tent about two feet, uh, maybe a hundred yards out from our window. Okay. And no, no curtains, no nothing. So the first thing the girls did was get balneary. So we lived in, uh, with windows with all balneary over. Okay, so how long did you stay in Maple Creek? Uh, about a week. Okay, and then off to? I went to, back to Regina. Okay. I went uh, to Maple Creek and they were gonna make me, get me a driver okay. because I knew all the, because I spent my time out not with my mother in the kitchen, learning to be a woman. I was out with my brother and my dad doing what I liked to do. With all the work with the, all, I knew all the tools and everything. Sure. And of course, when the tests that showed that I knew all that, they thought I could be a driver, but uh, that wasn't what was going to be happen because my brother was killed. I drove out, they took me out for a driver's test. I drove up, to where I was looking down on the hospital and they were taking in an accident. I turned off the key and slammed on the brakes and said, that's it. I never did drive. You never did drive. So what did you do as you were serving? I went from there to <clears throat> Regina, where I was, act I was in the, uh, I was uh, assistant mechanic. Okay. And we lived at, uh, uh, we had to move a motor out of the, we'd lift the motor up and put it on the shelf of the, on the fender. And then corporal was coming, sergeant was coming around, put that on the uh, bench right beside me to work on it. But I was just going to hold it on the fender. But when the chain hoist came off, it was going to go right down on cement. And I just turned like that and put it on the, on the fender. 
on the shelf. And, uh, you must have been very strong. My gosh, that's wonderful. So how long did you serve then as an assistant mechanic? That was the end of it. That was it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> they said, that's too heavy a thing. Jordan, you're doing too heavy a lifting. So okay. they took me to the supply depot, okay. which is your supply depot. It was all your food for your kitchens, well, the kitchens. Yes. We had 100 pounds of flour, put out, take up 100 pounds of flour, 100 pounds of sugar, put, carry it over and put it on the bench where we're up where they picked, had their orders, picked up their orders yes. every morning. But there was a day when there was all that stuff came in and that had to be piled up so we could take it up to the, <laughs> one by one. Sure. But it was a much harder job from the mechanics, <laughs> i tell you that. I can just imagine. So how long did you end up serving Two, in total? A total of four years. Four years and mostly within the Regina area then? Mainly in Regina, in, uh, uh, Edmonton is as far away as I got in Canada then until I was on my way overseas. Okay. Then I, I was in Kitchener for two months. Okay, so you did go overseas? I was overseas for two years. Okay, and what did you do there? I was clerk. Okay, and where were you posted? I was posted at uh, Farnborough North Camp. Okay. And that was by near Aldershot, which is a, was a big permanent army camp in England. In England. Uh, and that's where I met up with Bill again. Okay, your young friend. Uh, well, he was going, he was the postmaster, because his folks were postmasters at, where they, at home. And so he went into the post, uh, into the mail uh, part. So he was going through the mail and he found this, pulled this one out. And he got a whoop, he said, and they said, what's that all about? And he said, this is my half-sister's here. <laughs> he thought of you as his sister. He loved you so much from those younger days. Well, he was there when my brother was killed. He quit his job and came and worked with us until he went to the army. Okay. I was just following him along. And here in the middle of England, he sees a letter with your name on it. I was five minutes, five miles away. Five oh, miles. Over the hill. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he, the next day, I, I, we landed one day. I wrote those letters the day we got into camp because <clears throat> we're, until we were ready to get us training, training again in, in England. And uh, <clears throat> so we wrote letters all night. I wrote all to the, all the boys. Well, I knew that uh, we were in Kitchener. This is kind of going back and forth. When I was in Kitchener that two months, <clears throat> we were called out at five o'clock in the morning to parade through Kitchener. The troops had landed. <laughs> oh my gosh. In France. Oh my gosh. Two weeks later, I, uh, I was in England. My, what a beautiful story, but what a, an amazing adventure for a young girl from southern Saskatchewan. Yes, we raised her on the farm and we didn't even have so much as a telephone. <coughs> but we got around, we used horses or we rode horseback. I had my own little saddle horse, but I never got to ride him after I came out of the army. Okay. My folks had moved to town and the, the saddles were sold. And okay, so big life changes. We haven't talked at all about your life after the army. Do you want to just summarize what happened after the army? Well, yes. I had never been around <coughs> babies since my mother had it was six years between me and my sister, and then there was another sister, and then there was a brother, and the yeah. brother had his 86th birthday yesterday. Okay. And, uh, so I, you'd been around babies when he was born. He and Dorothy and Betty. Sure. But I'd never around babies again. Now you're an adult, you've come home come from home. the war. Come home. Yes. And I was supposed to spend three months doing nothing. Just relaxing. Okay. Well, in the first place, they give us a month while they're getting the, so more of the boys out, and then they 
called us back in to discharge us. Okay. They called me in to discharge me, and I was posted to the postal corps, or to the mm, finance. Okay. Well, I can't quite call it now. But uh, I was shown what I was going to do. It was on a fr that was Friday night, well, no, no, no army Saturday and Sunday. And Friday night I had been to a party, and uh, Saturday, I don't want to get arrested, I guess. And Monday morning I went to work, and I was having an awful time. I couldn't see. Having an awful time trying to see. Mm. I got to the, <clears throat> got there. I, the reason I couldn't see was because I was just shuddering from head to toe. Uh -oh. And that just, and I uh, couldn't see. And so I couldn't do it. So I was in the hospital for a solid month. Oh my gosh. And then they, and then they come home and then I was <clears throat> supposed to do nothing for three months. Okay. You've been in the army working for <laughs> the way we had. Three, Three months sounds like a year and a half. Sure, especially because you had been working so hard and yeah. so busy. So now you're going to sit and do nothing. Sit and do nothing. Well, I sat and do nothing for a while, and uh, I uh, got to know Walter, ha Walter Wagner and Walter, his mother, and dad were building a new house in Rock Glen. I was in, folks had moved to Rock Glen by then. Okay. Uh, and uh, so I was there in Rock Glen, and I, I went over. His mother was having to make meals and lunch and take them over to where they were working on the other house. Okay. And she was an old lady. She was in her 70s, you know. Oh, my gosh. She was an old lady. So I went over to help her. So I went over and was helping her, and I met Charlie Wagner, he's the oldest son of that family, and he was building a new house on his farm. Okay. And his wife was expecting a baby. And he said, asked me, he said, would you come to my farm and help? He said, and help me. He said, I've got the two children, Melvin and Deanna, and he said, <clears throat> And uh, my wife's due to go to the hospital any day now. Mm -hmm. And he said, I was wondering if you could, would come over, uh, if you'd come and work for me. I thought, oh, that sounds good, but how will I make out when the baby comes? Well, she's got there, she can get care of the baby, don't worry about that. But halfway to, well, closer than halfway, to his farm, he said, May, would you, be interested, and this, he just listened for a minute. He said, and my sister-in-law, he said, Harrison's wife, that's, he said, Lord, my sister, wife's brother, he said, his wife just got home from the hospital and she has an 18-month-old baby, but she has no experience of looking after baby, kids. And he said, would you go there? He said, she needs you right now, because she just got home today. Oh, I said, I guess one place is as good as the other. I said, I'll give it a try. So I went to Sherwin's to work. Okay. And when Harrison <clears throat> came, and his brother was working for him, helped through the harvest, and then he was going to university. He'd come home from the Air Force. And his wife, and they sat, lived up in a, they lived in a greenery set out there for the daytime and you know, uh, they uh, at home. Uh, she cooked for him and okay. I uh, had to cook for the other thresh the thrashers because it was thrashing time again. <clears throat> and uh, or the thrashers was all gone by then. Right. But he, when his uh, youngest brother came out, he said, he, had, he took he said, took a breath, second breath. I was standing, looking, working at the uh, the other way. He said he would swear it was Melville's first wife. She had died two years or three years, before, two years before. Okay. And uh, he introduced me, and that was 
And they said that there was this man who had just come back from overseas and was coming to work, and he'd be there for dinner. And uh, did I know anybody by the name of Robert Gentle? And I said, no, that's what I can remember of. And Robert had said the same thing. Didn't know anybody. No, they hadn't bumped into each other. We had never bumped into each other. Robert came in, and <clears throat> they, he, Harrison started to introduce us. In May, he said, you want you to meet and turn around and walk and I just went together like that. <laughs> Robert and I knew each other overseas. Ah, what a small world. Yeah. <laughs> and here he's at a farm in Rock Glen. Uh, I was on the farm in Cornac. In Cornac area. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And uh, that was just as I'll make, we, we were all just good friends, but. Uh, yes. But I. I was a good friend to the girls that drove the ambulance. He was the, he was the out driver for the ambulance girls. The motorcycle over the head, because they were night. He, there was a little, they had a little light, about that much in their, what in their cars, and they they followed the motorcycle at uh, how Robert saw the roads. I don't know, but he was on the motorcycle leading the ambulances wherever they had to go in England. Oh my gosh, what a job. Around that area. Okay. But that, then uh, I was working the next day and uh, the, my Her Harrison's father, Harrison and Mel and Earl's father were dying in Moose Jaw. Okay. So, uh, and my, Mel was down working for his, for, Charlie, the one that had the, I was supposed to go there. He was working there and he had his son with him there. I had met his son before the war. I'd met his wife and son okay. at a baseball game before, the, before I left for the army about two or three days later. <laughs> okay. And how old was the son now? The son now is 86. Okay. Had his 86th birthday the other day. And you met Melvin? Melville. Melville. I'll tell you how I met my husband. Okay. I was standing Mr. Bill up, washing him off. The, he'd been eating all, too many plums. Okay. Fresh plums. His, uh, Harrison, uh, Harrison and his wife were already in Moose Jaw. Okay. Uh, I had a new baby to look after, and I only got there the night before. And this 18-month-old boy, <laughs> And I was washing that boy down. They had a, you come in on, you come in the steps and you're into a room, just a room where they had, where they hung up their clothes and, sure. and washed off the dirt before they went into the kitchen. Yep. That's where I was cleaning down Bill. And this man come bounding up the step and, and I said, who the heck do you think you are? And that's the first thing I ever said to my husband. I said, girls, is that a good way to meet a man? It was, I met a wonderful man. <laughs> And you were washing off his son? His grandson. His, or his nephew. His should... nephew was all dirty, and here this young fellow he, comes he, in. He, he was dirty pants from eating plums. Okay. And was your husband looking for a wife? Not uh, directly looking for a wife. He wasn't looking for a wife especially, but I, I was busy doing that dirty job <laughs> with kids. He had three kids. He had a girl, five, and a little girl, two. The little girl, two, uh, Lydia had a week after her, she, she was born, she was up. The rest of the time, she, she was, his mother had taken care of Lydia before she went to the hospital, and she was taking care of Lydia and the kids then. Okay, so you know, you... And I, and I said, I do, in my wedding, I got three children. The minute you said, I do, you had three children. Yeah. A son that was eight years old. Yeah. And then these two little girls. Yeah. And what did your husband do? He was a school teacher. He was this local school teacher. No, not the local one. He was at Crane Valley. Okay. All right. So he, he taught school for 44 and two thirds years. And for the first 36 years, he had never applied for school. Wow, he just was always able to have a job. Yeah. Isn't that First one, his, his friend that he went to school with and they boarded together in Norma, 
called them because they needed it for a baseball player up in center field. And his, one of his best memories was catching a baseball in Medicine Hat at a tournament. Wow. And when that, he hit that ball, it was gone. Uh, and he caught it. He had to jump over a fence. He took, jumped over the fence and he caught that ball. Going, and he said, he stood up to a standing ovation. There you go. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's been wonderful. It's been an amazing opportunity to meet another Canadian who has a wonderful story. May Sherwin, thank you for sharing your story with us today. Thank you.